Hi everyone, and welcome to another episode of Mr. Carlson's Lab. The ART13 transmitter has arrived and it's on the bench right behind me here. For those of you that don't know what an ART13 is, it's the transmitter that works with the BC348 communications receiver that you've seen in the previous episode. That communications receiver is part of the Grand Receiver Restoration Series, and you know what? I'm going to include this in that as well. So we're going to restore a transmitter together. What's so neat about the ART-13? Well, both of these flew around in a warbird in the 1940s. I'll share more of that story when I restore this as well, and we'll talk a little bit more about that then. So I've just received this, and I haven't opened it up or anything, and I figured, why not share that experience with all of you? So let's see what's inside this thing. It's very heavy, so hopefully there's tubes and transformers inside, not rocks and bricks, because it feels about that heavy. So we'll open it up and take a look, see what we're up against, and we'll also take a look at this very noisy device on the side known as a dynamotor. This is the power supply for this transmitter and it creates a lot of voltage to operate this thing. When we restore this, we are going to use the dynamotor. We're going to try and make this as period correct as possible and we'll make some contacts on the ham radio bands. For those of you that don't know, yes, I am a ham radio operator. I've been a ham radio operator for years. So this will get converted and I'll share that experience with you as well. So a lot of great stuff coming on this channel. And again, this is going to be included in the Grand Receiver Restoration Series. So if you're new to the channel, definitely subscribe so you don't get lost in the YouTube rabbit hole and you find this channel again. All right, let's get started. Let's open this thing up and see what we're up against. This should be a lot of fun. I'm looking forward to this. Here is the ART13 transmitter, which is in fair condition. This is, you know, standard kind of paint coming off of everything and same with this here. And the dynamotor right here, which is very nicely mounted to a piece of wood. This is just the way that it came on its shock mounts and everything so it can vibrate and buzz away. So to operate this thing, it takes about oh, 30 plus amps to make this thing spin. I think the start current somewhere around 100 amps to get this thing going. So uh, current hog this thing for sure. I'll probably need to build a specific power supply just for this ART13 and I'll take you along through that. So that should be a lot of fun to get this thing going. Relatively low serial number, 76. So pretty early device right here. This is the interconnect cable for the ART13. So that connects from under here, which I'll show you here in a moment, to this side of the dynamotor right over here. So this stuff out of the way and spin this around. So that big connection right there connects underneath here. The connections right here. Receiver and antenna connections, everything on the side right here. Nice little push connections right here for easy connection. On the front of the unit, we have a whole bunch of controls that need to be set accurately, and uh, they specify that right here. I'll just zoom on in a little bit. And move it down. So set knobs accurately, very, very important in something like this. So nice, very positive controls. Uh, another nice thing about this is you can see the colors kind of faded on this. I got a, a box of some spare parts here, so I got another meter with some brighter colors in it. So looks a little bit nicer. And uh, this here is a bunch of capacitors right here, wired together. And the connector, this is very important. This is a power connector for the dynamotor. So that's very nice. Of course, you know, if I didn't have the connector, we'd make something to work in its place, but it's just nice to have all the interconnects with it. So antenna current meter right here, and we have a power amplifier grid and power amplifier plate here. And uh, this, so this is the emission control, so you can have voice, uh, CW, that stands for continuous wave, or modulated continuous wave, which is very nice. To select the positions for what you want to read here, battery voltage, uh, power amplifier grid, and power amplifier plate. And uh, just the standard, uh, you know, capacitors that we're going to see inside here and behind all of these controls for antenna tuning and loading and, 
and uh, changing frequency and all that kind of stuff. Spring-loaded test switch, if you can see that. So, yeah, it's looking like it's in not bad condition, you know. So let's take a look at the backside here for a moment. Got to be careful with the bench here because this thing will just destroy my bench. Just a bunch of breathing holes on the back. It hasn't come in contact with the bench yet. It's still sliding on this thing. So there's a bunch of breathing holes in the back here. I already see some very large vacuum tubes there. Let's move this back around. Okay, so here we are. Okay, let's open the top up. That's where the exciting stuff is. Grab a screwdriver from over here. What do you think is going to be inside this thing? A bunch of rocks and bricks or some lead. Well, we did see some tubes in the back, so it's got to be good. Hey, look at that. I'm seeing lots of tubes and coils. All this old radio goodness over here. All right, what I'll do is I'll move you forward and we'll take a look down into this thing. Look at all the RF goodness in here. So we have a vacuum relay right here. We have another relay over here. So it's contacts on the top and contacts on the bottom. Hopefully you can see this, I'll push on it. You can see the contacts move up and down. A variometer in the bottom. Isn't that nice? Bunch of mica capacitors here. This is the modulation transformer and these are the two modulator tubes. So when you're talking, this is what modulates the carrier. So, let's pull one of these out. They look like 811s. They are loose. There are little clips in the bottom that hold these tight, but they're loose. You see where the clips are. Slide into the clips down here in a little guide pin. There's an 811 right there. These are still relatively common in uh, amateur radio RF amplifiers. I think Ameritron uses these and all that still. Nice tubes, but they are kind of tender. In RF service, you got to be really careful. Just looking down in here, so I can plug that back in properly. Put the plate cap back on. Now, in receiving tubes, you'll see caps on the plates of receiving tubes. That's a grid cap. This is a plate cap in this case, so high voltages on this at all times, and they warn you about this in the case. In fact, I think they even warned you on the lid. Yep, see? So... You gotta be very careful being in equipment like this. So, this is the RF output tube here, which looks to be an 813. Hopefully I'll be able to pull this out because usually they're pretty tight. There it comes. That's the RF output tube, big tube. So just for comparison, this is a 6V6 that you would find in a normal guitar amplifier or in an audio system. So a 6L6 would be just a little bit bigger than this. So I'll put this back in later on. This has to be put in very specifically and pushed down. There's a guide pin and everything, so I'll be struggling trying to put this back in. I can tell you that already, so I'll just move this out of the way. And we have an RF section over here. I believe this is the 12 volt, 12 volt version, heater version of the 807. So, are the clips loose on this? They look like they might be cinched up. Nope, they are loose. There it is. So they are 1625s. So again, same thing as an 807 but they have the, uh, a higher heater voltage. So used in mobile applications like this, right? This is common for that. So, and of course, you gotta get these things right so that the uh, large pins, I can't see where the, those are the large pins right there. So you gonna line them up. There they go. 
Not easy like an octal tube like these ones. These ones have an index on the bottom. You can see a little index right here. So then they've got a little guide pin right there. So what you can do is you just put them on top of the socket and put just a little bit of down pressure and turn it. And once it aligns, it just kind of pops in. So you can see I can turn it on top of the socket. And there it pops in because the guide pin aligns up. So this is an octal tube, not to be confused with a loctal tube. Loctals are different again. So yeah, RF section and audio section here. See what else can we look at? Nice modulation transformer back here. Big potato slicer down here. Big tuning capacitor right down there for the antenna loading section. And all sorts of goodness inside this thing. Lots of caps that are going to need to probably go down here. These ones here are notorious for going bad, leaking over time and causing all sorts of problems. These ones down in the bottom here. And of course, underneath these chassis here, we'll need to get under here and check all the caps and replace them. It'll be fun to put this thing on the air and try it out, that's for sure. Again, I'll need to put together a specific power supply for this because it uh, takes a lot of current at 28 volts to run this, you know, 30 plus amps. And then of course, you know, the starting current of the dynamotor is uh, absolutely incredible. So and that's this device on the side, which you can't see. It's just over off to the side here. And I'll show you that here in just a moment. So I'll get this thing out of the way and uh, let's take a quick look at the dynamotor chassis and see what we're up against with that. Here is a very large dynamotor. Look at the size of this thing, big current hog. So what is a dynamotor? Well, what a dynamotor is, is if you were to compare this to something nowadays, so just say you want a 120 volt outlet in your car, you can buy those little inverters that plug into your lighter socket, or if you want a much larger one, uh, they'll wire directly to your battery, right? And you're usually a, a square block that looks something like a, a big car audio amplifier. So that's a solid state device. Well, this is a motorized device that does somewhat the same thing. All right, so kind of the same idea. So you can look at this is basically a motor with a generator on the other side of it. So basically kind of like two motors. So you have a commutator on this side and a commutator on this side. One side you feed 28 volts into and it spins the motor up. And then on the other side, there is another commutator and there's a lot more windings on the other side and it'll step that voltage up from say 28 volts to say 750 or something like that, depending on what the dynamotor does. And this one is designed to supply a lot of current because it has to power this entire transmitter. So let's take a look underneath the caps here and see what we get. So let's, uh, let's open this side first and then we'll go on to this side here. So I'll remove the screws. There's usually three of them that hold on each cap and there's a vent on each side, right? So they can draw air through them to cool them down because again, high current device and uh, they do create quite a bit of heat when they're running and they are noisy. But the noise is part of the fun with this. So now I could completely design a different power supply that would just have transformers that could eliminate this altogether, but that's no fun. We want to hear this thing whirring as we uh, make some contacts, right? That's the fun stuff. Look at the size of that commutator in there. There's the, uh, you can see the screen there. Look at the size of this commutator and the brush holders. Look at those big brush holders. Noise suppression right here. So a bunch of capacitors. Doesn't that look nice? All right, let's take a look at the other side. So the other side is going to have a fan on it. You can see it's much larger. So nice little circuit breaker down here. So if something does go wrong in the transmitter, it uh, will draw excessive current and that breaker will move or if a filter on the bottom here, or something goes bad, or a capacitor, I should say, on the bottom goes bad. Let's see, where is it? There it is. 
hear the paint crackling as this is opening. Okay, so let's take a look at this side here. Look at that side. Yeah, you can see the grill in the bottom there. And there is the commutator, a couple of them. So one here and one here. You can see two commutators on this side. So it's going to make a couple of different voltages here. You can see that. Commutator on the top, commutator on the bottom. And it doesn't look like there really is that much wear. So there isn't a lot of time on this, which is a good sign. I don't see any black charred windings or anything in there. So this is a good thing. I would imagine that the brushes are probably okay. We'll remove the brushes and inspect those when we get into actually powering the dynamotor up. Save some of that excitement for there. So again, more noise suppression on this side right here. These are nice and tight still, so nothing really has vibrated loose or anything like that. Ouch, that's pinched my finger in the bottom there. So yeah, looks nice. So that's what's inside of a dynamotor. And lots of windings in here, and of course all the, the stuff that you would see in a normal DC type motor, right? So there it is. So now I get the fun of putting this all back together and getting it uh, ready for when we actually go about doing the entire restoration on the ART-13 and its dynamotor power supply. I'm really looking forward to making some contacts on this and I will bring you along. Maybe we'll check into a morning AM net on this thing. Wouldn't that be a lot of fun? Thanks for stopping by the lab today. Are you interested in learning more about this type of electronics technology? Or are you interested in learning more about modern electronics technology? So circuitry repair, circuitry troubleshooting, design and diagnosis. If so, you're definitely gonna wanna check out my very busy ongoing electronics course on Patreon. There's a reason it's very busy and that's because I'm passing my skill set on to everyone there. There's over 170 videos there right now, completely separate videos from what you see here on YouTube. I also share many of my personal electronic inventions and designs, and there's many projects for you to build and for you to learn from. Definitely a great place to be, and I would say probably the best value for your money on the internet. That's the reason it's so incredibly busy. Check it out. I'll put the link just below the video's description under the Show More tab, and I'll pin the link at the top of the comment section. So just click on the link and it'll take you right there and you can check it out. All right, until next time, take care. Bye for now.